you have probably missed some of the best episodes of Software Engineering Daily. If you listen to just a few episodes a week, it can be difficult to identify the high-quality episodes. And if you are new to the podcast, first of all, welcome, you have no idea how to find episodes that might appeal to you. Software Engineering Daily has a discovery problem. We have 600 episodes, and much of the content is evergreen. The shows that we did a year ago on Apache Spark or Ethereum or React.js, they're still relevant today, and they get plenty of listens. Keith and Craig Holliday built a recommendation system for Software Engineering Daily. Then they built a Software Engineering Daily iOS app to improve the experience of SE Daily listeners. You can use the SE Daily app to find the most popular episodes of this podcast and to find episode recommendations based on what you have listened to in the past. In this episode, Keith and Craig join the show to explain why they built an app for Software Engineering Daily. You can find all the code for the SE Daily app at github.com slash softwareengineeringdaily. And you can also fork it in case you have your own podcast and you want a recommendation system for it. And you can contribute to it. We've also got a Android app that we're working on. We've got a web front end. We would really like to improve the user experience for Software Engineering Daily. We know the site is impossible to navigate, and you know the, the whole platform is fraught with its own issues. But we're, we're doing our best, and we hope this is going to make En-ROADS into building a better open source experience for organizing technical content about software. So go to github.com slash software engineering daily if you're interested in contributing. And I hope you like this episode. Cloudflare runs 10% of the internet, boosting the performance and security of millions of websites. Many of you probably already use Cloudflare on your sites, but we're not talking about using Cloudflare today. We're talking about building on top of it. If you're a developer, you can build apps which can be installed by the millions of sites which rely on Cloudflare. You can even sell your apps. They can make you money every month. Your users can log in or register to your service inside your app. They can get a real-time preview of your tool live on their site, and they can start paying you monthly, all from within Cloudflare apps. They can go from never having heard of you or your service to having it installed on their site and paying you in seconds. Visit cloudflare.com slash sedaily to watch how you can build and deploy an app in less than three minutes. That's cloudflare.com slash SE Daily. Thank you to Cloudflare for being a new sponsor of Software Engineering Daily. Keith and Craig Holiday are the developers of the SE Daily iOS app. Guys, welcome to Software Engineering Daily. Well, thank you for having us. Yeah, thanks. It's fantastic to have you on, and I'm really impressed by the work that you both have done in building an app for Software Engineering Daily. People who are listening on their iPhone devices can go to the App Store and download the Software Engineering Daily app. Why did you guys build an app for Software Engineering Daily? I guess it came off basically from a Twitter message. Someone had tweeted at Software Engineering Daily saying, oh, it'd be cool to have a recommendation engine. And just like real quickly, I've been messing with machine learning for a while. And I said, oh, cool. I've been listening to this podcast for a while. Let's do that. That sounds fun. So we created the web app and the recommendation API. I talked to Craig, showed him. He's like, why not do an app? And uh, that's pretty much it, you know, for mm -hmm. fun. Mm. And, and so Craig, when he came to you and, you know, was saying, we should build an app for this. What was your response? Yeah, so well, also, I, like just like Keith said, I was, I'd be like, oh, that's that'd be super fun. I Keith had showed me Software Engineering Daily, and I had been listening, but I had been using an app called Overcast, which is a very popular app on iOS, but it doesn't have any like recommendations, and it's kind of just it's here's the full list of podcasts, I mean, much like iTunes or anything like that, and that's kind of the the way that you listen to podcasts it's oh here's from this start date and just go in the line it's, it's like that's that's 
that's okay for certain podcasts that are very like maybe news heavy, but for software engineering daily specifically, everything's in categories. So, you know, like if I want to listen to just the business podcasts, like I, I'd rather have a section of just the business podcasts, you know? Mm. And so Keith brought this up to me and I was like, oh, that would be super fun. I've been messing around with an, uh, an audio plugin for, or for iOS. Like, oh, I've been building a library for, for it myself to use. And he was like, oh, we'll use it for this. I was like, yes, perfect. A project oh. that I can use it on. And, and yeah, so really it, it, for fun, it's, it's just a fun thing to do. We like building apps. So yeah, here we are. Yeah, that's right. a good point actually, because uh, like you said, the motivation is a little bit more why, why it's better for SE Daily rather than another one, another podcast is, you know, a news format, the stuff is not as evergreen as like Software Engine Daily. Like uh, Software Engine Daily has that long lasting content. It's not like linear in any fashion. So not just having recommendations, but categorized and discoverability is something that you would want. You would want to browse old podcasts more than like a news like a you know a new york times where it's just like what's today's news so mm. keith you find yourself doing that you find yourself looking through the old episodes and listening to them uh yeah i mean basically what i would do is just went through and reversed the order on itunes and just started downloading them to listen to them basically and then i didn't know you had a website at first and then i think you started promoting the website on some of the podcasts so i went to their to like search by the tags on WordPress, you know, so just much easier. Yeah, and it's it, <laughs> much easier, but still a pretty disastrous yeah. experience. You know, I'll, I'll fully admit that the website is kind of like, from pretty much any point of view, from a design point of view, it's a disaster. From an engineering point of view, it's a disaster. <laughs> um, and, and part of that is just like, I'm, I'm you know, I try, I try to focus on, delivering really good audio content and I pre- prepare a lot for it and it's what I'm good at but over time you know the, this has just become such an onerous problem where you know I, from and from very early days I wanted to make evergreen content I want to make this this stuff that people actually would listen to in a year or two years or five years by the way because I was you know you guys probably know this I stole the format of software engineering radio it's, it's another podcast I have been a part of for a long time. I loved the format. I cloned the format, and I just made it daily because I saw the the value of the evergreen content there. I mean, we I've I've seen the numbers, and people would go and listen. Keith, basically, exactly what you described. People would start from the beginning and and go forward in time. I think it's probably a little bit harder with software engineering daily because there's a lot of content. It's hard to it's hard to catch up to the present if you do that strategy. Uh, but I'm sure people do it. So. Okay, so we're talking about some of the things that are broken, specifically with software engineering daily. What are the problems, you know, in the podcast user experience more broadly? I, I don't know how familiar you guys are with the podcast infrastructure, but I'd love to get your take on, you know, since you both are fanatical podcast listeners, it sounds like, and as am I, what are the things that you see in the podcast ecosystem that are kind of broken? I'll start with this, if you don't mind. I, w- I would like to say just like, you're not the only one with this discoverability problem. You know, now since we're, you're asking the question about podcasts in general, there are quite a few other podcasts that have this discoverability problem. And I know one that I got started on was Radio Lab, And they kind of do these like stories that are not, I mean, sometimes it's relevant to what's happening right now, but you can definitely listen to them as an evergreen source. Like uh, you can listen to them at any point in time. And they're still kind of relevant and they've been doing podcasts for i don't know eight years or something so you can't one you can't even find all their podcasts on itunes and then two their website you cannot find anything it's almost the same exact problem so and i think that comes from just the fact that the way that itunes is set up and that's your de facto distribution platform and i think npr kind of noticed this by trying to create their own app, but that has its own ups and downs as well. But basic, or sorry, one more tangent, just content creators in general, like you can go on to find YouTubers as well with evergreen content. And since they're using, they're not building their own platform, they're using someone else's platform. They don't really think about the whole, how do I categorize 
per se as a top level view. Like if you're building a website, you're going to think of the UX and the experience of going through and navigating as a top level thing. But when you're using something like YouTube and iTunes as your main distribution platform, you're just like, let me post my content. They'll worry about discoverability and findability. <laughs> but that doesn't really work out when you have evergreen content, for instance. Right. And that's, I think that's a big issue with most content on the internet now since, I mean, YouTube specifically, where you put something out and it's like, well, you know, however many hours are being, however many hours of content is being pushed out per minute on YouTube. And uh, there's, it's just very hard to get discovered. And it's the same on, you know, the I, on iTunes as well. If you put out your podcast on iTunes, it's like, well, everybody does that. Uh, mm -hmm. So you have to have like the, another source of, you know, outreach to get people to even download your podcast on whatever device on whatever platform. There's a million different things now. And, and something that I uh, like specifically to podcasts that aren't evergreen, that are news based, um, that come out two, three times a week. I would like to have a notification system set up for that. Um, I don't use iTunes. I use Overcast, and they don't have a notification system for when a new a new podcast comes out. So I have an RSS feed notification set up in Slack to get notified when the next wow. Pod Save America comes out. Yeah, I, I I actually jump on a new episode of Pod Save America. Like, it's it's vicious. I love <laughs> that. <laughs> it's I, uh, well, I so, think, so. I think yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, we we all have those podcasts, the ones that we jump on instantly. Yeah, and so. Like any any content that you you need notifications for the people like us that say you know we want to watch it or listen to it immediately when it comes out. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think you're just clarifying more what I'm saying as well. Like basically, what's wrong with podcast? Well, I mean, there's a lot of good things about the podcast, but they're using a single platform or singular platforms, or they're using these global platforms. But what they're not thinking about is the normal acquisition and retention strategies that someone who develops an app from scratch does, you know, mm. you don't get to choose your retention plan or your push notification plan or your communication plan because you're opting into another person's resource. And that's fine for starting out. But as you grow with evergreen content or not, uh, you start need to think about, okay, if I were to serve this as my own product, you know, uh, how would I, start creating new types of notifications and findability and retention strategies, et cetera. So mm, exactly. Yeah. So one of the pieces of analysis that I've heard about podcasts that explains the stagnation in the ecosystem and the inability for the technology to get better is the fact that it's disjointed. It's so disjointed. You have overcast, which is, I would argue the best podcast player, and within Overcast, you can't even search by episode. I'm not sure why that is, but he Marco hasn't set up episode-wide search for some reason. Like, I can't search JavaScript. I will only get podcasts with JavaScript in the name uh, or in the description. I won't get, uh, you know, podcasts that have episodes about JavaScript. So Software Engineering Daily won't come up. So you've got Overcast over here. It's the player of choice, although more people use the, the I, iPhone podcast player, obviously. You have all of these different platforms where people are publishing RSS feeds, and they're just, just RSS feeds. And then you have iTunes, which is this really weird old system of record that everybody just happens to use for indexing all of the podcasts. And by the way, it only indexes the RSS feeds. And then you know the, you have the other problem, which is that uh, and this this is a this is a problem that hopefully somebody will solve. But the problem that the content of a podcast, the meat of a con of a podcast, is audio content, and audio is not readily indexable. So for most things on the internet, it's just in text format, or there is at least some metadata that is text, and text is easy to index. We all know how to do that, and you can search, you can build search engines over text quite easily. You can't build a search engine over audio very easily so most of the meat of the content of this podcast is in audio and there's no ready way to turn that into an indexable service however you know the fact that there is so much fragmentation actually i think has led to 
more democracy in some ways, where there you don't have these centers of power within the audio ecosystem. Do you guys see like a trade-off there? Are there some pros of the fact that the ecosystem is is fragmented and somewhat broken? So by fragmented, you mean like there's an overcast and an iTunes because... There's no Netflix. There's no YouTube. There's no strong centralizing force. Obviously, iTunes has some large role, but it's not dominant. See, I would, I would like to see stats on that because I would think that actually it is centralized and centralized to like uh, big players if you will like I feel like you have your Netflix you have your Hulu you have your HBO now and then vice versa you got your iTunes your overcast etc maybe yeah they're they're the housers of the content not well they're becoming content creators now in the video realm but I think in the podcast realm you have your de facto I mean Spotify is stepping in too like you have big house centralized sources which is not uh, a bad thing, I guess. I think it's a good thing because I think it does create the ability to centralize your distribution. So if you are sure, sometimes it's hard for findability, but especially at the beginning, and maybe that's why it surged, is because these uh, podcasts can go to a central resource and people can just find it on one place instead of everybody trying to advertise their their disjoint websites or something like that. Mm. So I think that would be the benefit, I guess. The only nope. downside I see to it, as I said, is as you grow and as you grow your audience, using that central repository cannot be your only source. We're trying out something new with the Software Engineering Daily question of the week. This week we want to know, what is the best continuous delivery or continuous integration tool, open source tool, or platform, some software as a service that you use. We want to know what is the best continuous delivery tool and why you're using it. Send me an email, jeff at softwareengineeringdaily.com. We're going to evaluate the answers and we will select a random person who emails us and award that person with a free Software Engineering Daily hoodie sweatshirt that we will send you. And then we will compile those answers. We'll get you a write-up in a month or so with the feedback for what is the best tool. So send me an email, jeff at softwareengineeringdaily.com. We would love to hear what you think about continuous integration and continuous delivery tools. Let's switch to the topic of, of the Software Engineering Daily app that you guys built. So... I think we we talked about the fact that Keith, you originally built this recommendation engine for software engineering daily episodes, and then you talked to Craig, and you guys decided to build an app. Uh, so explain what are the goals of the software engineering daily app, and if somebody takes out the app today, what are they getting out of it? Keith, why don't you why don't you start? Yeah, so I think it's two main things discoverability of your old podcast right now we just have the main topic feeds but we're definitely hoping to add more uh filtering for tags so there you go discoverability of podcast and um recommendations so it, when you log in and you start upvoting downvoting things this will create uh, recommendations for you so just a nice little machine learning touch and craig how do you see it how do you see the goals of that yeah, uh, like like Keith said, discoverability. If you go into the app now, you can see categories, or which are basically the tags that are on your WordPress site. But it's it's in a very digestible way with your app, and you can actually play an audio while you know play any podcast while you're searching through for another podcast. You can you know it, we have same the same basic abilities of any other one of your other favorite podcasts so it'll play when you close the app it'll save your place in the podcast the basic features that you've come to love in your other podcast apps but specifically for software engineering daily and specifically for each category that you love and then the recommendation engine is like really the nice over the edge of like if you need to download the app because you can upvote whatever podcast you like. And you're going to, if you upvote a po JavaScript podcast, 
you're going to get something along the same lines in your recommendations, you know? Right. And, and so you're never going to, you're never not going to have a podcast to listen to. Right. Now there are also, so there's certainly the upvoting and downvoting system. I could also imagine some more latent bases for doing recommendations. For example, if I listen to an episode and I listen all the way through, maybe that's a piece of content that you can use as a seed for recommendation. And if I listen, if there's an episode I listen to and I only hear 10 minutes of it before I switch to a different one, that's maybe a topic that you don't want to recommend to me, whether or not I have, uh, I've upvoted it. So are, are you thinking about those kinds of building those kinds of things on top of the recommendation engine? Oh yeah, definitely. I think the first recommendation I implemented was probably one of the most, or sorry, one of the easiest uh, algorithms you could implement, which is just a simple K clustering with a certain qualifier quantifier. But I mean, you could do so much more with recommendations, especially as large as the uh, content is for Software Engineering Daily. I think we could start grabbing stats, like you said. So we could take a user's ID and then take a, the podcast ID and then take the time, listen to it before stopping or if not finished in a Boolean value and then put that through something more sophisticated or just even moderately more sophisticated to compare results in a machine learning algorithm um, I mean, if we had enough data, it's all about collecting that data. Right now, we don't have like listener data, but if people are interested and they start listening, it's easy to create those, you know, regression analysis that starts moving towards a machine learning algorithm to start recommending even better content. And as far as the app leads to just a way to open up the software engine daily community to more content. You know, anything that if people go to the software engineering daily, they can probably see more things that you would be able to post on your website that you can't post in iTunes. So that gives the content that, or that's one of the goals is to kind of like expand the community of software engineering daily and the content that can be there. And then just to continue back on the recommendation, we could take the knowledge of what we learn from what you're listening to on recommendations and recommend other content as well. I mean, software engineering is a learnable, always ongoing learning content. So there's no reason that we can't take and learn from your listening habits and try to introduce you to other things that you can learn from. Mm. Yeah. And, you know, what I am so impressed by and what I'm so happy with is the fact that you guys built this. And this is something, you know, ever since Prene was the, the, the original person that worked with me on Software Engineering Daily, and we were talking for a long time about building some sort of app, building either a web app or a mobile app or figuring out how to broaden the ecosystem of Software Engineering Daily, figuring out exactly what it should become. But the thing is, we at the time, we were so focused on we need to just make enough money to because this is our job. So we were so focused on trying to sell ads and trying to do the right shows and grow the show properly and improve audio quality. And there were so many things that we were just trying to work on so we couldn't get to the app. And then, you know... I started to get some success and, and the, sh the show was doing well and money started to come in. And, but then I started to work on this other thing that you guys probably know about ad for prize, this company that I'm building. And now that has started to consume a lot of my time. And in some sense, I felt a guilt about, about this because, you know, for a long time I had been saying on the show, listen, I, uh, you know, I'm doing ads because I want to build this into a big business, and I know there's there's kind of a lot of advertising on the show. Uh, I know some people are averse to that, but I, I do put a lot of work into the show, and I'm trying to build it into a successful business, and I intend to to roll that adverti those advertising dollars into building a bigger media company within Software Engineering Daily, and that still is my intention. But what I have done that has hopefully not undermined the trust of the listeners too much is I've rolled most of that money into ad for prize. And I've, I've just worked really hard on ad for prize because I had this idea for ad for prize and it was a software company. And I, you know, as much as I love building software engineering daily, I, when I, I'm going to continue to build it, I really wanted to work on a software platform to, to, you know, just put the, put myself to the test, right? Because you know, if I'm just a journalist reporting on software engineering, does that really, you know, obviously I'm, you know, decent at it, and I think I'm reporting on it in a way that is useful to people, but I wanted to put myself through the trials of building a software company. Of course, th again, what I'm trying to say is I redirected my resources, my financial resources and my time 
to building ad for prize and i have felt a sense some sense of guilt that that has undermined my ability to grow the platform and i still fully intend to do that but it's like right now i'm sort of in a phase where i need to i'm tr- focusing on growing ad for prize i'm focusing on raising money for it i'm focusing on getting the team right and doing sales to brands and all this stuff that that nobody who listens to software engineering daily knows about because i don't talk about ad for prize too much but that's why i was so happy that you guys built this app because this is it's essentially what I wanted to build with Prene like a year and a half ago when he was working on Software Engineering Daily. And, you know, I, I, I'm just, I'm really thankful that you guys have built that because it, it does give, a, you know, you can look at the Software Engineering Daily mobile app and you can see a vision towards growing this to a broader media company or a broader media organization. Maybe it's open source or something. I, I don't know. What do you, what do you, what would you guys prefer? Since you guys are, 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 you know, the lifeblood, part of the lifeblood of the community, what would you want Software Engineering Daily to become? Like, would you like it to be a news organization? Would you like it to be some sort of open source thing? Do you want it to be on the blockchain? What do you want? <laughs> <laughs> when you were talking, it reminded me of the uh, podcast you did with the Washington Post, where I, I believe it's the Washington Post, right, that Bezos owns. And they were talking about how they're also thinking of themselves as a software company. And you're saying, um, I'm just a reporter. And I'm like, well, you know, Washington Post is a reporter, but apparently they create software now too, right? So (laughs) who knows? Yeah. And speaking Uh, to your, your, go ahead, Keith. Sorry. I was just going to say, to answer the question about like the vision, I mean, yeah, just what, you know, you said we're avid podcast listeners. So I watch podcast podcast grow and expand i also watch other companies grow you know craig and i are both in the startup world so we both understand how the startups grow and how they how they uh, become different products and how they pivot and you know as you always say like you want to grow software engine daily into a media company i always ask myself well what does that mean and i guess it means like more media right uh i was like well you already have daily content so what does that really mean but i mean yeah it means like media in different ways you know, different content, whether it be written or video Mm -hmm. and just a different ecosystem of education, really. I mean, that's kind of, you you do infotainment type stuff. And I think you have a very awesome niche and a very top of the line way of hitting at these top level topics. You know, there's a lot of people starting to write about things like blockchains, but interviewing the people who are doing that. I mean, no, that's that's a very awesome and nice niche to be at to be able to talk to a person who is like developing something like blockchains or azure iot for instance is Mm. the ones i can remember off the top of my head and yeah so expand on that you know expand on these these niche topics expand connections with these people that you're meeting with and also create different mediums of education for the listeners that's what i would think what about you craig yeah well so first to speak to your earlier statement about kind of moving your focus to your other business. You know, that's something that I think software engineers in general are going to understand. You know, when you when you say, you know, hey, I had to focus on something, on one of my other projects. Well, software engineers have three or four projects going all the mm-hmm. time, you know, or at least like two or three ideas in the back of their head and all of them weighing on them equally. It, at least that's my experience. And I, Keith can attest to that as well we have too many projects to think about while we're finishing projects. So, but yeah, like, in, you know, edutainment it has been, is I think is the name of the game because that's my, that's my favorite part of this content. And like most other content, um, I love, you know, like general, like movies or, you know, some funny gameplay YouTube videos, they're great and all, but a lot of the time during the day, I, I want to learn something new but I, but I also don't want to listen to a TED talk that's, you know, <laughs> that's, that's not like really trying to make me laugh with it. You know, you can learn and laugh at the mm. same time. And that's, I mean, that's just me. That's just like, I, I love comedy, but I also love learning new things all the time. So mm. uh, like any content that pushes that out, like that core concept is something that I want to consume mm. and also want to build because along with learning things i also like to build things that teach other people you know like it's just it's all encompassing it's just a fun thing to do with well, that yeah. seems 
Well, I was going to say, that seems like something that you two both share. Like, you guys both like the idea of education and building stuff. Yeah, I mean, we're, one, we're open source developers in our, most of our startups and most of our projects. So, you know, we already have that sense of giving back. So that just kind of comes along. And then, I don't know, I think as, if you're, if you want to become a really good, well, at anything, but definitely a software engineer or programmer or whatever, you have to constantly be learning. So edutainment, Craig, that's a good one. I didn't hear that one. Is the good resource, right? Entertainment while learning. It's good. So, How did the development of the app go between you two? How did you separate the tasks? And what was it like working on a project with your brother? Well, we, we work on a lot of projects together. I think everything we've done... Well, so how, how long did it take us to do this from start to finish, Keith? Uh, I have no idea. I don't really record because we work on it like so, you know, here and there. Very couple hours here, a couple hours there. So, well, well, my fiance Kylie said two months because that's the amount of time that she's heard about it. Um, oh, because <laughs> at the end of the day, I, I'll tell her everything that I've done. Oh, the, and so she she says two months ago is when or two months since the release is is when we um, when we started it. So, but working on stuff with your brother first off is. Well, it depends on your dynamic with your brother, of course. But Keith and I are both just workaholics, I would say. And so we just give each other tasks and then we deliver and then we show off to each other all day. Mm. Is is pretty much our dynamic, I would say. Um, yeah, I think and, we... Oh, go ahead. Yeah, so so Keith finished the, the website of things and, and showed it to me. And I was like, this is awesome. And he was like you should make an iOS app. And I was like, that's awesome. I should definitely do that. And I was like, how would I do that? And he said, it would look like this. And I was like, I can do it, all of that, you know? <laughs> and and like, I, we, I also have a lot of iOS experience. That's what I do day to day. So divvying up task was, I was just tackling one part at a time. I, I don't know if you want me to go into specifics of how to build an app ground up, but. Well, p- please do. I mean, why don't you, so why don't you guys break it into the the portions that each of you wrote? So, Keith, I know you wrote a recommendation system, which was basically an API that you could just hit and get recommendations, I guess, based on a query. Maybe you could talk about the recommendation engine because that came first. And then, Craig, you can talk about your steps, like what you built on top of that. Sure, sure. Yeah, so I was just showing Craig yesterday this... Uh, this post by Google on their Android docs about how to build a well-architectured Android app. And I was like, this is the way to pretty much build every app at the beginning. And so to go through that flow real quickly, I think the idea is to have your, like your model and the way that you want to display the model, I guess. So obviously we had the podcast model and what you want to do is filter through those podcasts and then we also had the idea of getting recommendations which requires some sort of liking system in the k clustering because you have to cluster by the points basically so i should say point system so yeah so that was so that's the starting point we decided we have this model we have a structure that's already created and we just need to organize it so what we usually do in our projects i believe we usually do this we either build just a blank UI with dummy data, or I'll build the API on a server. Uh, For this one, I just use Node.js, and then I use a Mongoose and Redis database, Redis for the point system, and Mongoose for persistence, or Mongo for persistence, I keep saying Mongoose. And then I built just a web UI to wrap that up. And then, yeah, I think from there, what Craig has uh, the strengths in iOS, like he said, so I was, Jeff, you sent us a mock-up and I edited it a little bit and then sent it to Craig and said, okay, man, here's the API endpoints, please build this. And that's, that's how we divvy up the task, right? Yeah, yeah. And so, so Keith says, you know, Keith basically gives me all the endpoints and everything to do with the API that I need to know. And then I start off with just building the UI with dummy data. Really like UI is the thing that should take you the least amount of time if you have a design coming forward and I have a lot of custom stuff built out already to make UI the quickest part of an app 
And so basically I went through my, you know, just making a few collection views, making some detail views for the podcast to like read all the information on it. And then I hooked it up to an API. So used Alamo Fire for the API um, with Alamo Fire Object Mapper and Realm for persistence. And then, yeah, you just hook, hook up all your collection views to Alamo Fire API. And yeah, you have all your Realm objects live updating inside of your collection views, which is nice. And then the audio player is probably the thing that took me the longest just because I built it from scratch. And that's, you know, it's just an AV foundation built on top of a custom class that has just a lot to do, basically. So what I did was I looked through all the AV foundation document uh, documentation on Apple. And then I looked through about three or four other open source projects that do relatively the same thing as what I wanted to do. And then, yeah, I just built on top of that for about like a week or two um, until I got it working exactly the way I wanted it to. Yeah, then, I mean, then it was pretty much done. And it was just bug this, fixing from there. This is the thing that's just the persistent player that if you, you know, sleep your phone or if you switch between podcast episodes or if you want to fast forward 30 seconds or something, this is the the little player that does all this stuff. That's what you're talking right. about. Right. It was kind of the ball. Yeah, it's your board. audio. Yeah, it's your audio visual manager. So this, so AV Foundation is the Apple API that you can use in any of your iOS projects. So you so you have that, and you just pass in URL from what is it, Lipsyn, or oh, whatever That's the, right. the yes, yeah, the um, direct link to the MP3. You can just pass that in to an AV asset, which is what it's called in iOS. And then you can play it and you can just, um, you know, you can skip ahead, you can stop, pause, switch out the asset, however you want to do that in, in your app after that. So, but I had to build out something, something very custom to actually do all that and not look like crap. Look for a job more efficiently with Indeed Prime. Indeed Prime flips the job search model and lets you find a job more efficiently even while you're busy with other engineering work or coding your side project. You simply upload your resume and in one click, you get immediate exposure to companies like Facebook, Uber, and Dropbox. The employers that are interested will reach out to you within one week with salary, position, and equity up front. Don't let applying for jobs become a full-time job itself. With Indeed Prime, the jobs come to you. The average software developer gets five employer contacts and an average salary offer of $125,000 through Indeed Prime. It's 100% free for candidates. There are no strings attached. Sign up now at Indeed.com slash SEDaily. Thank you to Indeed Prime for being a repeat sponsor of Software Engineering Daily. And if you want to support the show while looking for a new job, go to Indeed.com slash SE Daily. I think working on components like an audio player, I was doing this for the Android app, uh, which we still haven't pushed live, but... It seems so simple because you see like audio players all the time, but when you're learning how to build apps, even in the Android documentation that I was referencing, they kind of show you how to manage your life cycle and your state and your flow with respect to caching and reading from a um, API. But you still have to apply those same concepts to something like an audio player which has its own lifecycle caching mechanism, but the caching comes from the file system or a URL file system directly into a stream, which you then manage and process. Um, and I think, I don't know, I just find that fun to think about the same sort of lifecycle progress that you would think of an API, but your, your input, I guess, if you think of API as the input, is now like a local stream from a file system. Uh, it reminds me a lot of like working in uh, like a Linux or like a kernel uh, module or something like that. It's very. Oh yeah, and I and I took the um, the audio player and 
took that, uh, abstracted it out of the SE Daily project and made that into its own open source project because it was so fun. And I was like, oh, well, I can do anything with this. And I think that's, that's also part of the um, architecture that Keith was talking about earlier is to have everything separated out because I can drop in that player anywhere into any of my projects now. So that's um, great. It's, it's really thinking ahead like that. Too. Is there if there's somebody out there that wants to use that kind of thing? Is there what's the name of the repo? Oh, sheesh! It's in our um, it's in our quality code repo. I, I can't remember what I called it though. I okay. think I called well, it quality player. If you guys want to look okay. it up on GitHub, quality yeah, maybe we, quality we, like the bear, tea like the drink. Sure, sure. Well, we <laughs> could we can uh, we can put that in the show notes maybe. But uh, you know the the proclivity towards open source, I think, is interesting to get into. What's your the the roadmap for you two in terms of what do you want to open source here? Are there people? Would you like other people to get involved? Like if there are other listeners, like for all I know, maybe there are other listeners that want to work on the iOS app or work on the Android app or improve the recommendation engine. Are you guys planning on open sourcing this all this stuff? Yeah, we're definitely planning on open sourcing it. In fact, I think everything is on GitHub right now. Uh, what we would like to do is move it to like a software engineering daily group right now. We just kind of, I think Craig and I have a habit of making sure that we have everything on GitHub immediately. So it's just on our own repos or in our, we have a group called quality for our uh, side projects that we put things under. And um, so basically the roadmap is hopefully, I don't know, within the next week, it doesn't take long. We'll move it over to like a software engine daily group and post this, it. I, and I need to set this up, right? You, in fact, you've told me this. I need to set it up and I keep putting it off. I need to do that. Oh, yeah, yeah. that'd be great. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But well, please, anybody in the community that would love, that, that likes to contribute to open source, come on over. Or if you'd just like to see how everything works, how the code actually looks, you know, that's, um, we, we love open source. Like that's just our that's our deal, you know. Yeah, and I well, I want to make I'll, I should make some way. Maybe I'll talk to Quincy Larson about this because he knows about managing. I mean that the guy who runs Free Code Camp, Free Love Code. It. I mean, yeah. he, that's the most starred GitHub repo on the internet, and so he has some idea how to grow and maintain open source repositories. I should talk to him because I think there's probably something there. I'm I'm sure. I mean, there's. You know, so many people that listen to this show, there must be some that are interested. I guess, you know, by the way, if, if anybody's hearing this and they and by the time that it airs, if it's still confusing how to find this stuff, you can send me an email or I'm sure you can find Keith or Craig on the Internet and uh, ask them how to get involved. But maybe do you guys want to talk a little bit about the roadmap? So, like, I think I think one thing I don't know a whole lot about open source development, but my impression is that. One thing that makes an open source project do well is if somebody is in charge of it and they have a vision for it. I mean, obviously, there's things like Bitcoin. Well, even Bitcoin, like Satoshi laid out a pretty broad and ambitious vision in the white paper. And I think people who have been working on it since then have just kind of contributed to that vision. And the things that they implement on top of it are trying to stay true to that vision, um, although sometimes there's controversy around that. But I think the vision is really important. Like, where are we going so that anybody, even if they're working on some micro issue within the audio player, they know how that fixing that issue contributes to the bigger vision. Do you guys want to discuss the vision that you have for the app? Yeah. So to talk about managing open source communities real quick, um, I work at Habitica right now full time and we're 100% open source constantly trying to compete to beat Quincy's repo on on GitHub. I mean, we're we're no small. We got we got like 5,000 uh, stars or something like that. So, you know, we're not too far behind, but still um, it's me and about three other developers that would probably manage the open source as a whole, the community. And we have tons, uh, we have quite a few contributors on a daily basis. I think we have, you know, 10 to 15 PRs come in a week. So I have a lot of experience doing that. Uh, so I think I know how I would like to manage community with that aspect. Um, of course, it's a little bit, it's core to our business at Habitica. And I guess, I'm not sure, does Quincy do Free Code Camp full-time? He does. Um, he saved up a bunch of money as a, just, I think he was, a, you know, he had a, s- a series of jobs and also his wife has a full-time job. But uh, yeah, he does it full-time. Yeah, so I guess the open source is really pushed forward when 
the package or the uh, library is like managed by someone who depends on it, you know. So I think that's true for Free Code Camp as well as Habitica for us. Um, so yeah, and as far as a roadmap, I mean, I think right now, correct, correct me if I'm wrong on any of these things, I think right now we want to get everything into open source, uh, release the Android app as well, and gauge interest and see if people have any initial feedback, what they want. Uh, we really want to focus on uh, discoverability. I think that's, I think that's number one. Like, how can we find podcasts? How can we, you know, maybe track your progress through your podcast? Uh, how can we do anything that just makes interacting with the current content really well and make it findable? And then I think we need to number two. I think we want to focus on any kind of specific engagement features. You know. Um, I think recommendations is kind of an engagement feature, but anyway, for um, I don't want to go too far into it, but like any kind of community management things, any kind of uh, promotional things. Um, I think Jeff, we talked about maybe even having some sort of like ad-free content on there, paid subscriptions. That's a possibility. There's quite a few ways we can go with that, and yeah, I mean, I'm not sure technically if there's a huge roadmap besides making cool recommendation stuff, if people like recommendations, we, we can, I think it would be a good learning opportunity for anybody trying to get into machine learning to start on something as simple as a point system and an analytics system and being able to uh, recommend things to other people. And that's, I think that's one of the great benefits of open source is having a fun project to learn something higher for you. Craig, yeah, you have definitely. any, you have any other vision visionary things on your mind? You know, a lot of it is really uh, stuff that you wouldn't you wouldn't see, but you might feel on the back end of the iOS app. Uh, I do a lot of just like, you know, performance fixes here and there after I release an app. You know, something that the the average user would be like, oh, this is just how this works, and I'd be like, oh my god, why does this take two seconds longer than it should take? <laughs> like, uh, you know, and, and I just, uh, of course, you're overcritical of your own work. So things on the back end like that. Really what I can see is if we start getting different types of content into the app, what would be a, the biggest challenge is how to balance that information and show it correctly and, and making it discoverable inside a singular app. Yes. Because um, it's, it's very understandable to see, oh, this is a podcast app. There are podcasts. Uh, it's, it's a lot more complicated to say, oh, this is a podcast app and I'm going to read this news story, this this blog post or... Uh, I'm going to watch this video as well. And making that all understandable to every single person that opens the app is um, would be a challenge. And, I, and I'd love to tackle it is the thing. So, Yeah, that's a good point. I think there's times in the uh, podcast where, you're, where you bring up a topic and you're like, oh, if you don't know much about this topic, we did a podcast on it. So go look at these other podcasts. And you could almost call that like a prereq for a certain podcast. I mean, not... It's not always necessary to completely understand the prereqs in the interviews, but especially if we have other content or future content, I could see a nice progression surrounding some of these podcasts. So I keep going to blockchains because it's only because I'm reading a book on blockchains right now. But so say you go to a blockchain podcast, it would be nice to be to see, okay, here's some prerequisite knowledge that you might want to look over if you're interested in this topic, uh, to really understand it, here's some podcasts we covered. Maybe here's some links to other resources that people have used. Maybe you can just view the links. Or um, if you want to continue more, here's our recommendations. Or here's something that has been written by the community. Like a, here's a tutorial that's been written by the community or something. And so not only be able to see that whole big picture of if I want to learn about machine learning, if I want to learn about blockchains, what's my prereq directly from Software Engineering Daily, and can it even help me and guide me through that prereq process of I started here and I ended here. I think that's a good vision for it. Yeah, I, I'm happy to hear both of you say that. I mean, So what I would be building if I was not spending so much of my time and money on Adforprize is, in addition to what both of you have said, my goal with Software Engineering Daily is we we would like to become a really kind of a a large content vertical and and what I mean by that is 
you know, when I go to a coffee shop and, or if I'm going to have a cup of tea and I'm going to sit there for an hour or 45 minutes and I'm going to read a bunch of stuff, I, I, you know, I always look forward to these, you know, t- times in my day where I've just got my smartphone and, or maybe I'm just like go, well, going for a walk in the park and I'm going to sit on a park bench and read material for an hour or something. This is, I mean, this is something that I really enjoy doing. Or maybe I'm going to watch some videos also. You know, I use my smartphone for a variety of things, like different content consumption types. I would love to, you know, and I, I mean, so I, I switch between different channels. Like I'm, I'm, I'm opening up Hacker News, which is, you know, typically in some app that's not built, you know, it's, it's, an, it's well built, but, uh, you know, it's not the best experience. I open up Tech Meme, a Tech Meme reader, and that's, again, not the best experience. Oftentimes it's linking to, like Wall Street Journal articles that I might not have access to behind the paywall. You know, I'm opening up Quora. I'm looking through stuff. I'm looking through Facebook and Twitter. I wouldn't mind having another channel to switch to. Switch to. I wouldn't mind going into Software Engineering Daily and being able to look at written material that's perhaps related to the podcast I was listening to on my way to the coffee shop. Maybe I want to find a video. Maybe maybe I can open up the po- the the Software Engineering Daily app and I can find videos that are related to what I'm listening to. Uh, maybe there's a way to find job opportunities that are related to what I'm listening to. That's a little bit more far-fetched. You know, I'd like to focus on the content generation side of things. And certainly community. Like, why not have a community around this this thing? I mean, there's, a, there's 1,800 people or 1,500 people in the Slack channel. The Slack channel is fairly active throughout the day. And, uh, you know, I think there's, there's just more room for communities there's more room for content, for shareable content, better content consumption, and you know I think you guys are really laying the backbone for you know I fully intend to as soon as Adverbrise gets in a little bit of a better state where I don't have to constantly be monitoring and keeping tabs on it, and uh, I can I can divide my time a little bit more, a little bit more where I can have some more time to spend on software engineering daily, or you know maybe you guys take over the project or think of think of certain some way we can uh, work on it together I don't know it, it, it's interesting seeing where you guys are taking it and and I hope that more of the community gets involved and I'm, I'm definitely going to encourage people to get involved if if they're interested uh, and by the way you know what you mentioned Keith about the the kind of the, the, the paid subscription version where we don't run ads that is absolutely something that is it's it's so close to the top of my list of what I want to do because there are so many people. I think there are a lot of people who perhaps even have stopped listening to the show because they're just like, I don't like these ads. I don't want to listen to these ads. And that's fine. I, you know, I, I totally respect that. You should have the option to have a pay, to, to pay to not hear ads. It's just completely fair offering. And we could fork our production strategy where we produce two episodes, one version of each episode without ads. There's no reason why we can't do that. And anyway, so so yeah, I'm I'm kind of rambling here, but I'm just I'm very inspired by what you guys are building, um, and I'm I'm looking forward to to helping to drive more traffic to it, and eventually, when my time is a little more freed up, contributing to it myself. Definitely. Yeah, I, yeah, yeah. I think there's a lot to be expanded on. I think, like you said, and the Slack channel is pretty active, and people are always asking for more resources and continuing. And I think. Like I said, I think these topics just in themselves are very top of the edge. Like they're very edge topics. They're very top of the line. They're very new. They're very fresh. So I think that is where we can expand with more content, more resources, or at least help curate content at the very least. And then, of course, yes, uh, ad-free podcast always sounds fun. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and, and really, like the, the community side is is such a big part of it and that I'd like to not only hear from the community about things that you guys want, but also how you would like to see things in front of you, like how you would like the app to look or how, you know, other other community websites that you like. If you guys want to, if you guys are going to interact in an SE Daily app, you know, what other apps do you like to interact with other software engineers in? Because the only other place that I talk to other software engineers is Reddit. It's, it's, it's probably the only thing where I can type out like a very good response to someone and go back and forth or, or link something properly. Like I can't really do that in Twitter. Um, I can do that in Slack, but there's there's very few channels and you have to be invited to that channel kind of thing. So, so I really like to know more of what, where everybody's at 
in the software engineering community mm. and, and what you guys would like to see. Mm. Yeah, that's great. So, so anybody who is interested in discussing this, you can sign up for our Slack channel, send me an email, and I'll connect you to Keith and Craig, or you can you know tweet at them. So, I, okay, I know we're going over time. I just want to touch on one more area because you guys listen to the show so much, and you know, the show is is something that I continue to to work on and and spend a lot of time on. I I know I haven't been able to improve the the uh, the website very much but i promise i am working a lot on on the quality of the episodes i focus you know on on improving my breadth of research my depth of research the the, the quality of the guests i'm interviewing what would you guys like to hear more about what can we improve on what are the types of episodes that you like and that you dislike i would love to get your feedback on the show itself Specific, me specifically, since I'm a mobile developer, I'd love to hear more about mobile ecosystems. You know, that's just, that's my bread and butter. But I also like in-depth dives, you know, it, into certain topics, like Realm, you know. And it, it's, I, I understand it's a, it's a lot harder to do a deep dive into Realm code when you're talking through, it, when it's audio, but even kind of talking concepts of developing apps like we have today, that, that's kind of the stuff that I, I want to see more of because that's what I go search for after I listen to a podcast, you know, after I listen to, you know, uh, the, the latest Lottie animation one. Well, I went to the GitHub repo immediately to look up how to do this in iOS and React Native, you know. So like that's that's kind of the stuff that I like to see and and since I am a developer I like to see code as well and like any way we can bridge the gap there is like the real the best of both worlds for me. Yeah, I agree uh especially on the mobile I think I I can't remember the last time there was like maybe a Android specific topic or something like that. Perhaps never. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, yeah, I mean, Android definitely has a huge world out there, and uh, Kotlin just got introduced, so I'm sure a lot of people would like to hear about some Kotlin stuff. Uh, I mean, I, I hear a lot of React Native stuff, as far as which you could count as mobile, but I mean, it's not quite the same. There's still a whole ecosystem outside of React Native that, you know, React Native hasn't reached the whole Android ecosystem. In, in fact, they're, like I said, they're moving towards like Kotlin, for instance, and not the other way. So there's there's uh, resources around there that could be introduced. I th- I hear a lot of good stuff. I think I I think the interviews are very relevant and on the topics uh, that I like. And you also take recommendations through Slack very well. I mean, sometimes I I think maybe there's some more practical things that I'm missing. I I mean, as a person who always likes to implement, sometimes I hear these like cool ideas and they kind of like say go here to learn more. But I would. I would like to know more about how people use certain technologies directly in a product or directly in an app. I don't know. That's very vague. But I I think the interviews are very theoretical, which is great. And sometimes even practical when you interview a person like, you know, like the Free Code Camp or Lottie, who's using an example. But there's some high level stuff that I still blockchains back to blockchains, because that's all I can think about today. I learned a lot about blockchains and I think there was one podcast about how people were using blockchains in a real app, but the more and more I read about blockchains, I see that you can use it for other things besides, you know, like currency. And uh, it'd be cool to maybe like hear from people who have libraries or who have other businesses that use these technologies in their day to day. Yeah. Yeah. Completely. Well, I completely agree on the blockchain stuff. I mean, I am just way behind on the amount of blockchain reporting I need to do given all the uh, attention that's going on there. And and, uh, yeah, I mean, I think there are, I don't know, I'm sure there's more applied blockchain stuff that I could, I could cover. Um, I think the closest thing I've come to, to an applied use of blockchain is that the show I did about ad chain, but even that was still kind of slideware when I talked about it. Now the ad chain is doing really well and they've really got some stuff off the ground. Okay. Well, or that's that's very useful. I will do more shows on Android. I I've, I've actually I've, I've built some stuff in Android, so I know the know the space a little bit better than probably the average topic that I'm covering. Okay, 
Well, I want to thank you guys for coming on the show. It's been really great talking to you, and uh, it's, uh, of course, an honor that you are both building an app for you know this company that you know you guys don't have any direct skin in the game and i you know i i want to uh just encourage people to check it out and i uh i i promise i will have a way to karmically uh or or monetarily or some otherwise directly repay you guys for the work that you're doing cuz it's it's just really fantastic and i'm 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 starting to use the app to listen to software engineering daily episodes i'm dog fooding it thanks again Thanks to Symphono for sponsoring Software Engineering Daily. Symphono is a custom engineering shop where senior engineers tackle big tech challenges while learning from each other. Check it out at symphono.com slash S-E daily. That's S-Y-M-P-H-O-N-O dot com slash S-E daily. Thanks to Symphono for being a sponsor of Software Engineering Daily for almost a year now. Your continued support allows us to deliver content to the listeners on a regular basis. Wow!